great to be back. Um, while the pandemic was going on, I had planned a fourth part of this uh, series, so I'm glad to get it done. And this is the live and in-person debut of it. So, uh, yeah, Tony, would you have the lights for me, buddy? So here we go, everybody. Welcome. Good afternoon. Are you ready, by the way? Oh, yeah. yes. What? Are you ready? Yes. yes. All right, here we go. Welcome to and Open Curfew. <laughs> the mild's influence on popular culture, and I apologize for eavesdropping on y'all's conversation. Wow. One of you said, they're only showing parts one and two. Good. Somebody <laughs> disparaged part three, as you should have. But anyway, uh, this is about the Chicago mild's influence on popular culture, and the one of the many um, programs that I have that I kind of subtitle Murder Chicago Style. So over the course of this, when I started this whole mob um, series. It did start as a series. It started as one part. I thought it was going to be a nice, clean, neat telling of the beer wars of Chicago in the 1920s. But the complicated, incredible, entangled history of the Chicago mob yielded not only the Capone years, the post-Capone years and the, the, the transition from the Capone era to the modern era, to the Giancana era and beyond, and I said, man, i got to put a bow on this so gun at some point. And so I started to think, what would be perfect? I started to look at all of the things that we have recognized and adored when it comes to the mob in America, which includes film, early film, includes television, hang in with the monkeys. Uh, what else? Cartoons. Yeah. Lampoons of mob culture in movies about making movies and television. What else? Postmodern African American drug culture. <laughs> Literature. I, I looked at all of these things and said, yeah, everybody talks about New York, everybody talks about New York and everything. However, most of the greatest anecdotes and the juiciest language with regard to mobdom, if you will, in America, have very little to do with this town, but rather the center of the universe, Chicago, U.S. of A. I mean, goodness gracious. Cartoon, Chicago mobster. So, before we get going, if you have a telephone and you all do silence them, because I did not drive all this way to Indiana to hear somebody's phone go off, because I might look cute and sweet, but I'm not. Um, Nobody laughed. Thank, let's try that again. I might look cute and sweet, but I'm not. <laughs> Thank you. Please silence your phones and save your questions and comments for afterwards. That'll give me plenty of time to make up a plausible sounding answer before we get there. All of the images, my friends, I do so. I use them within the fair use parameters of the American copyright law. I am my mother's second favorite child, Clarence Goodman, and here we go. Early films when it comes to the mob, and you, you would think that mob culture would begin with literature, but it does not, it did not. It begins with early films. Symbols of prohibition, because really, this is where mobdom in America begins. It begins with the advent of the Volstead Act and the 18th Amendment, and prohibition beginning in 1920. The Thompson submachine gun. Yes, the Thompson submachine gun. The interesting, albeit short lived history of the Thompson submachine gun starts, oopsie, click, in World War I. America's participation in World War I, y'all know about World War I, trench warfare, warfare, and so forth. And so Brigadier John Thompson comes up with this tiny little adorable version of a big machine gun to clear out trenches. It's going to be perfect for a Yankee, a dope boy, to come up and be gone and not have to look it around. But damn it, the war ended before they got to use him. And so you had thousands of Thompson submachine guns sitting in warehouses. And for a hot minute, you could go to a hardware store and buy a Thompson submachine gun. Ace is the place with the helpful <laughs> submachine gun. <laughs> All the time. But they were incredibly expensive. So who could afford such a gun? Ooh, mobsters. When the Roaring Twenties start to come around, and then eventually the Thompson submachine gun, the Tommy gun, becomes not synonymous with Chicago. 
Because New Yorkers, with their very sunny way, would much rather walk up, hello, how are you, with a 38 and bada bing, blow their brains out. We loud, vulgar, obnoxious Chicagoans, we want to kill everybody in the room. So you come in with a Thompson submachine gun, and everybody who dies is collateral damage. And so the Thompson submachine gun, until 1929, was almost used exclusively in Chicago. And it was a Chicago mobster, a fellow by the name of Jack McGurd, who used the Thompson submachine gun outside of Chicago in New York for the first time when he was wiping out Frankie Yale, who was somebody who had double-crossed Al Capone from across the country. Ultimately, though, the Thompson submachine gun is known as the Chicago typewriter. <laughs> Why? Because as you shot it, da -da 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 -da, those shell cases hitting the floor sounded like an old typewriter. And everything I'm saying today, my friends, is complete, 100% truthful but I, but I do I never let the truth get in the way of a good story but all of these good stories are 100% <clears throat> truthful <laughs> and so the Thompson submachine gun how does it come to Chicago this fellow here Mr. Guns N' Roses himself Dean O'Banion Dean O'Banion for those of you who know the mob he was the guy who owned the flower shop that was across the street from the Holy Name Cathedral. And this guy, had he not died so, when, so suddenly, at such a young age of 36 years old, he would have been the most legendary mobster in Chicago, but he didn't live long enough to really make his legend last. He brought the Thompson submachine gun to Chicago from the West. He spent a lot of time in Denver, and he thought this was a perfect way. This was before the beer wars even started. He just thought, it's nice to have these on hand in case something happens. Dino Banyan, a fascinating cat, he was ambidextrous, and so the legend about him was that he had his suits fitted with little pockets on either side, so he'd have a derringer on either side in case somebody got the drop on him, he could go either hand. That's going to come up in this uh, popular culture. Now, another of his best friend and his second in command was this fellow. His name was Jaime Weiss. Jaime Weiss, what did he do? Jaime Weiss is credited with taking the Chicago typewriter and combining it with a car, inventing the drive-by shooting. And that's an incredibly lethal weapon, a Thompson submachine gun and a car. So when we, remember, 30 years ago, the 1990s, everybody was worried about, oh, drive-by shooting, blah, blah. Chicago <laughs> invented it in the 1920s. Jaime Weiss gave us drive-by shooting. What else? Oh, yes, I should have showed you this. Modern day drive-by shooting. The one-way ride. Yes, you all heard that. We're gonna dig it for a one-way ride, see? That's another thing that Jaime Weiss gave us. Jaime Weiss would very quickly, in dispatching people that he had no use for, He'd ask his second in command, Vince the Schemer Drucci. Hey, Vince, take that guy on a one way ride. Got it? And a one way ride it, it inevitably ended at the bottom of Lake Michigan or the Chicago River. And this leads us to not the Simpsons per se, but just to show you how deep, deep, deep this stuff is in American culture. You've heard of the old, give him a pair of cement shoes, see? Right? I mean, we've all, we've got images of movies of people, no, don't do that, and people being put in wash tubs and then cement around there and then thrown in Lake Michigan. Yeah, that's a Chicago thing. The whole thing about the cement shoes, also known as, give them a pair of Chicago galoshes. Another thing. And the Chicago overcoat. This is absolutely implausible, but somebody actually tried it. So the idea with the Chicago overcoat was not a fur coat like my mother had in 1967. She looked beautiful, by the way. But it was the idea of putting somebody in a case of cement, quick dry cement. So 30 seconds later or 30 minutes later, they'd be encased in cement and then they'd be wheeled to Lake Michigan and thrown in the water. Um, as a means by which to um, silence them. This was known as the Chicago overcoat, but they didn't have quick drying cement back in the 1920s. So if someone had been thrown into Lake Michigan with this 
multi-meal-like cream of wheat thing going on around their body, it would have washed off of them or washed off of them, and they would have been able to swim away. When I was a little boy, people who used to watch Channel 9, the late, late, late show, come on, all these old get hey, come over here, she. The, the early montage of clips that they had, they'd have Jimmy Cagney hitting this lady in the face with um, a grapefruit. And as a little boy, and not realizing how misogynistic and horrifying that was, I just thought it was slapstick. Because, you know, Three Stooges, Jimmy Cagney, my father, who all of these people who, thank you, <laughs> these people who got laughs. And my father was, he really is a slapstick guy. I thought it was funny. And then I'm like, hey, yeah, this, is, this is what mobsters do. And then he's like, you get all this like that. Hit the lady in the face with a grapefruit. That's not really nice. Well, this was based on something in Chicago. Once again, Jaime Weiss was at a restaurant in downtown Chicago, and of course, secured and everything. And one of his models or one of his women is there, and apparently she said something he didn't like. So he takes a bowl of oatmeal and gives, gives her the mush. You've heard of the, the expression, giving somebody the mush. That's what uh, Jawan Howard did in that, ba that basketball fight a couple of years ago. He didn't hit the guy in the face. He just, Man, get your ass out. Oh, get your butt out of here. That's giving somebody the mush. It's the first time I've cursed in all of the years I've been coming in here. Sorry, man. Well, I'm going to retire on that note. Good night, everybody. Um, yeah, so he, Happy Weiss, takes this bowl of oatmeal and gives her the mush, which is mean, but, you know, at least he didn't get any grapefruit ju juice in her eye, and it was did wonders for her skin. All the, all the women are nodding. That's absolutely right. My grandmother taught me that, too. So that's another Chicago thing, she. Uh, Chicago pineapple. What's the Chicago pineapple? How did we grow a pineapple in subtropical sub Chicago? That's really the south side of Chicago. When you go far enough south in Chicago, they got all kinds of breadfruit and pineapples and so forth. Yeah, the Chicago pineapple. So part of the beer wars was a guy will roll in to a bar. Oh, how are you? Yeah, who, who are you buying your beer from? Ah, Capone. I'm here representing the Dino Banyan Company. We'd like you to buy from us. Oh, no, I'm buying from Capone. And then what happens the next day? Somebody throws a bomb in there. This is the Chicago pineapple. They actually, in addition to getting a catch of um, the Thompsons, they had hand grenades. And hand grenades became known as the Chicago pineapples. Are you enjoying this so far? You're all laughing. So you're either laughing at me, and I just washed these jeans, um, or you're enjoying all of this stuff. Oh, and this leads us to... Al Capone. You've heard of it. Have you heard of Al Brown, the furniture salesman from the South Loop? Yeah, that was his front there at the uh, Four Deuces Club. He even had uh, business cards made up. Al Brown, antiques and furniture, because they all had fronts. But Al Capone is obviously the centerpiece of the Chicago mob, the centerpiece of the Roaring Twenties, and the centerpiece of mob culture, and the thing, the man from whom most of these legends stem, but to put it in historical perspective and context, it is 2022. 100 years ago, Al Capone had been in Chicago for three years, and he was a 23-year-old kid working for Johnny Torrio, but he was on his way up. Nobody heard of Al Capone outside of the south side of Chicago. By the time Johnny Torrio retires, semi-retires in 1925 and then fully retires in 1926, Al Capone is a kid in his middle 20s and he and he's Johnny's underboss. He inherits the Southside mob in 1926. Five years later, he is sent away to, to the penitentiary where he essentially spends the last lucid years of his life. So to put that in perspective, Al Capone was only this meteor this absolute flare flying across the American sky for five years. And these five years were the, were the meat years of the so-called beer wars of Chicago. It was not the entirety of the Prohibition era from 1920 to 1933, people getting shot. It was five good years. And Al Capone was in jail by the time he was 32 years old and not released until he was in his early 40s and dead before he turned 50. 
I have outlived Al Capone by, for, excuse me, 12 years. And I'm a youthful, boyish man of 60. Um, Al Capone! <laughs> Al Capone! We've had one! Two! A three! A four! A five! A six! Seven versions of the Capone story, the most recent of which with regard to the Scarface pictures, this picture from 40, it's been 40 years since Al Capone, wow. God, no, 40 years, 50 years since The Godfather. This is how brief mob culture has been in America. Let me back this up a little bit. We had the original click, the original click, the original click, <laughs> same as it ever was, click the original Scarface back in the 1920s. So we had a long time between the first Scarface and the second Scarface. Yes, featuring Boris Karloff. Yes. <laughs> he comes in tap dancing on the Red Skelton show, and then uh, he winds up at Scarface. Yeah, and then before that, we had all of these other ones. Yeah, and what else do we have? And the image of the American gangster. What do all of these Capone pictures have to do with the triumvirate of the first generation of mafia mob actors? George Raff, Cagney, obviously, and Bogart. What did it have to do with Capone? Capone was the first widely interviewed mobster in American history. And because Johnny Torrio had sent him to night school for elocution lessons, Al Capone who grew up dirt poor in Brooklyn, and by the time he got to Chicago, he wasn't talking like this anymore. Tori, Tori, from Tori from Brooklyn, you know, and he wasn't talking like a Chicago. Hey, we're going in the front room, and all of that. He was talking like this. Hello, that I cannot do. Hello, I'm Al, I'm Al Brown. I'm here to sell you furniture. What, you don't like my furniture? Uh, would you like to go for a one-way ride? Al Capone, for a guy who never got to high school, spoke brilliant English because Johnny Torrio sized him up and prepared him for this. He saw in Capone the same thing that John Lennon saw in Paul McCartney. I need this guy in my band because he's almost as good as me. John Lennon's words, not mine, although he was right. Um, yeah, so all of these dudes eventually interviewed later in life about the signature roles they said, yeah, it's based on how Capone carried himself, not the flashy hats and the belt buckles that would make Hank Williams Jr. envious, that kind of thing. It was this quiet, hello. Machine guns, not, machine guns notwithstanding, Al Capone was a pretty calm dude. Al Capone gave interviews to anybody and everybody. Luella Parsons, the gossip columnist, gave, he, gave, he called her up on the phone once because she, she wrote something that he didn't like after the, 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 the Jack Dempsey um, Gene Tunney fight, which was at Soldier Field in 1927. Everybody was there. And Capone was there with, I'm sure, really, really good seats, even better than your seats are today. And uh, Luella Parsons writes all this trash about him. She's throwing all kinds of shade on Capone, and she's still in Chicago. Her phone rings. Ring, 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 ring. Hello? Progresso? No. Ring, 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 ring. And it's Al Capone saying, uh, you threw some shade on me. I'd like to talk to you. And he, he motors over and talks to her. And guess what? She wrote a complete retraction of all the shade she threw on him. But, so this is Capone before people are even aware of it and have ever seen him in newsreels because newsreels weren't a big deal then because talkies <clears throat> weren't really on the scene until well into Capone's reign. And then by the time the country was overcome with talkies, Capone was already in jail, practically. So this is the Capone influence. And then this brings us to the thing that brought you here. All of this charm? No. Murdering people. That's why you came. The hits. The hits keep on coming. And so, hey man, 1968 downtown Chicago, in conjunction with the Democratic Convention, when you come into Chicago with flowers in your hair, unless you're a member of the Chicago Police Department, we're gonna slap the crap out of you guys unless you get back under those rocks from which you came. The Battle of Michigan Avenue. How many of you remember the Battle of Michigan Avenue in 1968? Starting right there in, on the corner of Balbo in Michigan and all of the hippies and all of the yippies and all of the dippies, and here come the cops. 
And boy, let me tell you, as a little boy growing up on the south side of Chicago, that was more fun than watching the roller derby every uh, Sunday <laughs> afternoon. So they call this Walter Cronkite. Damn, there are a bunch of thugs out there, this Battle of Michigan Avenue and all of this stuff. And Dan Rather got hit in the mouth, which, you know, it's kind of cool. All of these big shots now getting hit in the mouth. So they had this Battle of Michigan Avenue. But wait, the original Battle of Middle of Michigan Avenue was some 62 years before the same spot. This is a postcard of Chicago. Look at that. There's the Art Institute of Chicago. There's Grant Park, and there's Michigan Avenue, and we have, that is the Blackstone Hotel, and then we have the Congress Plaza Hotel, and the building here, this was the original Standard Oil building. Not the AIM Center of today, which was built in 1974, but the original Standard Oil building was right here. And a gentleman, and Jaime Weiss, here's Jaime Weiss again, he had an office there. And so one day, and this is this is after Al Capone has had Dino Banyan killed. So next up is Jaime Weiss running the show, and in this war against Capone, Jaime Weiss is walking down the street from the Congress Plaza Hotel, where every gangster big shot had at least one suite of rooms. It's almost like the Congress Hotel was the United Nations building. Nothing could go on there, and nobody could get killed. So, oh, I'm safe. Ooh. Asylum, please, I need asylum. Um, Jaime Weiss is walking down the street, tra la 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 la, with a, with a briefcase filled with cash. A million dollars cash that he was going to uh, make a contribution to the local parish, right? Uh, probably not. And he's walking with some of his thugs when out of nowhere, a bunch of Capone dudes roll up and they're hitting Jaime Weiss. Shoot up the joint, they miss Jaime Weiss, and they leave him with his money because they weren't there for the money. So, Jaime Weiss escapes narrowly. One week later, this time he's in a car. Do, 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 do. I still need to complete this deal with the same million dollars cash. Capone's men come out of nowhere in cars, cut him off. B machine gun to join up. They don't hit anybody. So, clearly, everybody needed shooting lessons or a trip to the local eye doctor or something because nobody's eyesight was any good. So, this was called the Battle for Michigan Avenue where there were exactly no casualties, <laughs> no damage, nobody took any money, but it made all of the papers and it sold a ton of newspapers. The Battle of Michigan Avenue, ooh, and the hits. So, everybody, good Catholics, raise your hand like me. You know that most of us, <laughs> and, your, and with your spirit. Um, the Holy Name Cathedral, the cradle the center of the Catholic Archdiocese in Cook County. Beautiful building, beautiful architecture, but it's most known for these two things. So across the street from the Holy Name Cathedral, which was, uh, which still is just short of Chicago Avenue on State Street, you had Dino Banyan's flower shop, which was his front. Dino Banyan not only had a very, very <coughs> lucrative flower shop business, across the street from the Holy Name Cathedral. He was a part owner, and he was an actual floral arranger. And he would always have his nice black vest on and a yellow boutonniere, or a red carnation, or whatever, whatever flower was red of the day. Maybe a spray-painted daisy, who knows? But he'd always have that in his lapel. And his specialty was funeral arrangements, as you can imagine. <laughs> and so the joke around Chicago was, hey, if you got a funeral, not only is Dino your guy for the flowers, but for an extra hundred bucks he'll throw in the body. <laughs> that was the joke about Dino Banyan. So this, this, this beer wars of Chicago had been a cold war with a little territorial dispute here, another one here. And then Dino Banyan double crosses Johnny Torrio and Johnny Torrio winds up in jail. Johnny Torrio's underboss, Al Capone, takes the seat while Johnny Torrio is in jail and says, I'm going to get this guy. And so Al Capone calls one of his oldest pals from New York, Frank Yale, um, and two of his associates to come to Chicago. Now, Frank Yale was a made hitman of the New York Mafia. And the legend about Frank Yale was he only left the five boroughs of New York to kill people. So if you heard that Frank Yale was in your town, you locked your doors, got your teddy bear and a blankie, and you hid until you heard that he was on the next thing smoking out of town. So, 
Mike Merlot is the president of the mafia in Chicago, and he has just died. And he is the man who has put a kibosh on this Cold War turning into a hot war. His death from cancer not only says all bets are off, but it gives Capone the perfect opportunity to set to even the score. And so the morning of the Merlot funeral, $100,000 of arrangements on order at O'Banion's Flower Shop, which ensures that he's going to be there arranging flowers. And in comes Frankie Yale with two associates. Their names were uh, Albert Inselmi and Giuseppe, oh, forgot his last name. It's, Tortellini. Thank you. Would you, what did you say? What? I said Tortellini. Tortellini. Why is it high not? Why is it? It'll come back to me at some point. But they are all two made men from the, for the Mafia, and they eventually become Capone's most favorite um, architects, Tortellini, is it? <laughs> Sucker! Um, they walk in, introduce themselves, and Dino Bandy thinks, oh, these guys are here for flowers. And they shake hands. Now, think if this suggests anything. They shake hands, and Frank Yale, shaking Dino Banyan's hand, his right hand, knows that, let me stand so you can see me back there a little better, knows that he is ambidextrous, grabs the other hand, and then the other two fellows administer what has been known as the Chicago handshake, which means two bullets in the brain while the dude is, is being wow. held fast. What does that sound like? Luca Brasi in The Godfather. Yes, the Turk stabs his hand, keeping it down, and the other thugs hold on to it because Luca Brasi is the most feared hitman in New York. So, Dino Banyan is D-E-D -E -D dead. And Heidi Weiss takes over, and then he and Capone are having a solid 18 months of trying to kill one another. Well, Heidi Weiss is retaining the flower shop right there as his headquarters. And he and a car full of his thugs are on their way from Cook County uh, Courthouse, where they've undoubtedly been trying to tamper with a jury. Um, driving at the quarter mile to the flower shop where they have a meeting. They have no idea that Al Capone's newest man on the payroll is a fellow who will be a legend in his own right, Machine Gun Jack McGurn. Machine Gun Jack McGurn has stationed a hit team here. And so when all of the thugs get out of the car here, the amount of bullets that rain down on these cats not only kills most of them and almost takes the top of um, Jaime Weiss's head off, but there are still pockmarks in the facade of the Holy Name Cathedral. Two of the most spectacular hits in American mob history happened within a year and a half of one another at essentially the same spot. And then, of course, the granddaddy of them all. So if the Cold War of the, the 1920s in Chicago becomes a hot war in conjunction with what happened in 1924 and 25, Clearly, clearly, clearly the Gettysburg, if you will, of the beer wars and the climax and the end of it, essentially, is the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. We all know that this was Jack McGurn at Capone's behest ending it. But the St. Valentine's Day Massacre is absolutely transcendent when it comes to mob hits, when it comes to murder, when it comes to almost any kind of wrongful death. You can be a person, if, if you found somebody on the dark side of the moon and you landed, walking around, hey, how you doing? Earth man, where are you from? I'm from Chicago. Oh, St. Valentine's Day Massacre. As you ladies were saying when you were in Europe. Yeah, first time I went to Europe. Oh, he's from Chicago. You know, people hide, which is cool. There's essentially a lot of work when it comes to intimidation. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre, oh my goodness, so transcendent. You could say that the parody of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre is the premise of Some Like It Hot. Who's seen Some Like It Hot? It is one of my favorites, Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis as jazz musicians accidentally witnessing the St. Valentine's Day Massacre that makes them go undercover. And there you have the ensuing two hours of hilarity and Jack Lemmon tugging on his stockings. That's uh, pretty great right there. Also, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So <clears throat> three months after the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, 
when Capone has essentially mocked up everybody and gone out and had Jack McGurn kill Frankie Yale in New York because he was being double-crossed and this was the first use of the town since a machine gun outside of Chicago. Lucky Luciano in New York, who's got this vision of a national crime syndicate, he says, you, you Chicagoans are getting on my last damn nerves. This is our thing. Cosa Nostra. Chicago, shut the hell up. And so Lucky Luciano convenes a meeting, a summit of every crime boss in America. Absolutely unprecedented. And it happens on the boardwalk of Atlantic City. And so it's all of these hoods. And this is a picture of Al Capone, who's smiling in this picture. Hello, I'm Al Capone. I'm rich. And I'm only 30 years old. But I look like I'm 50 because I had a target on me for the last five years. He's smiling here. And a bunch of his henchmen, this is before the actual meeting, where all of these, and you think they're in a board meeting. I wanted to bring you guys together because Chicago, you guys are a little loud. No, they're all in little groups carrying the messages and carrying the information about the meeting from one to another. And Lucky Luciano was just kind of overseen because they don't want anybody eavesdropping because Lucky Luciano was an absolute visionary. And Al Capone is smiling here because he hasn't been told yet that Lucky Luciano says, uh, Al, you need to disappear for at least a year. And if you need help disappearing, we can provide that for you. And so Al Capone essentially stages his own arrest three days later. And this summit here is the basis of every mob summit that you've seen in the movies and on TV. Because after this one that happened in 1929, click, the next one that happened was the Appalachian Summit in 1957 where the Chicago mob is now represented by Sam Giancana. That's a whole nother story. So every time you see from Robin and the Seven Hoods to, how did he get this club? <laughs> is he gonna bring your boy back to you and more boy back to me? We are quits. That kind of thing to, oh, and say, yeah, so every time, sorry, pivot, every time you see what, some kind of summit, some kind of meeting, it's based on this big, meeting that happened after the St. Valentine's Day ma massacre. Now, literature, mob literature wasn't even literature. It was um, th the first book that really made any traction with regard to the American mob came out in the early 1960s and that was the Valachi Papers. And a lot of people between this book and The Enemy Within by Bobby Kennedy, this was a lot of Americans first knowledge of, whoa, Really? All of this has been happening? My gosh, everything we touch in this country is tainted by the mob? Well, cool. I'll have another helping, please, of that beer that cost me 25 cents. But the Balaji papers come out, and then this is when a lot of novelists start saying, wow, there's a lot of stories here, and we've been making movies, and nobody has really uh, touched literature. And so people start writing some stories, and then, I apologize for saying this, but the godfather of all mob literature comes out, was it 1968 or 69, something there? And Mario Puso, rest in peace, he wrote this as Pulp Fiction. He wrote this to get paid. He wrote this because he had a novel due. He had no idea that it was going to change the world. I dare say change American history with regard to the arts. And one of his last interviews, he said, Mr. Puso did that, if he had realized The Godfather was going to be as popular, he would have written it a lot better, <laughs> a lot more literate. But The Godfather is really where the literature begins. So just within the, 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 the rights of the, the Puso characters and the Puso name and the trademark and the copyright, you've got a couple of dozen books there. You, in, in, the, in the middle 1960s, there were, in bookstores and in libraries, there was no such thing as a true crime section, you know, uh, Truman Capote withstanding. And then after The Godfather, you, had, you go to any bookstore and you go to the true crime section and there's a whole wall dedicated to mob literature. That is based on The Godfather and The Godfather in so many ways, though it's entirely set excuse me, primarily set in the five boroughs of New York, and then we have a little Las Vegas, and then we have a, lot, a little Los Angeles. 
the whole Chicago, the whole New York stuff was inspired by Chicago stuff and all the things that stem from it. The Godfather saga. So from the first mention, from a historical perspective, of Vito Corleone, Vito Andolini, and who obviously is Vito Corleone, all the way to the end of Michael Corleone's life. This is Chicago stuff. What movie has ever had a better first scene than The Godfather? The juxtapositioning between Vito Corleone and the wedding going on and whoever ever made you treat me so disrespectfully? <laughs> Be my friend, Godfather, and the wedding going on. Mario Puso said that this was inspired, the whole wedding scene and everything and this backdrop for all this action was inspired by this wedding. There was a fellow who worked um, in Chicago. He was the, he ran the boss, the, the mob for a while. Tony Accardo, also known as Joey Batters. He had a huge, huge wedding for his daughter at their home. I think it was at either River Forest or Oak Park. I forget the court, because a whole lot of mobsters just moved, relocated along the Eisenhower for some reason. Yeah. Well, then maybe they had a little piece of the Eisenhower. Um, this was inspired. This inspired Puso not only to write this scene in The Godfather, but then when Coppola did the movie, he said, "Oh, we're going to totally have it based on this wedding that took place in Chicago." And then the centerpiece of The Godfather. Everybody who's only seen The Godfather, they miss the essence of what The Godfather is about. You see the first Godfather, and you're just waiting for somebody to get blown up, somebody to get shot up, somebody to get. Killed in a total booth. All of these things when the essence of the Godfather story is the conflict between Michael and himself. Michael's past and the future that he has gone out of his way to avoid. This, my friends, is based on what touched off the beer wars of Chicago. So yeah, this, this scene here. Landed on the cutting room floor. I wish I had seen this scene because we never were made privy to this conversation at the wedding, obviously, between Santino and Michael. But this, its roots are in Chicago. And so, before the wedding is even over, Tom Hagen says to Don Corleone, you're going to have to see Salozzo. And, and, and you can feel Brando's, oh, I'm going to have to see this. And all because... We know Solozzo wants the Godfather to get involved with drugs. This is based on 1920s, this whole thing in the meeting, and somebody, oops, saying too much. This goes back to the 1920s. So this is Johnny Torrio, a man who needs no introduction, and this is Big Jim Colosimo. Big Jim Colosimo was the first big-time pimp in Chicago's Levy District, and he was Johnny Torrio's boss and uncle. Um, and it was all about women. It was all about women in Chicago from as early as before the Civil War into the 1940s, the Levy District in Chicago. I kid you not. Um, Big Jim Colosimo, he looked like a cartoon character. He was not. By day, oh, oh, oh come, let me, let me fix you a plate of spaghetti Colosimo. And he walked around with a bag of diamonds in his pocket like a watch fob laying with him. And he looked like this cartoon. Oh, oh, oh. He was a bad dude. He had women kidnapped from around the city, around the Midwest, forcibly addicted to narcotics, and then gang raped in order to get them ready for a life of prostitution. Business was good. He brings his nephew from New York City, Johnny Torrio, to run things. This guy looks like a dude who taught me algebra, or tried to teach me algebra about 40 years ago. Johnny Torrio comes up with this very professorial thing, and he's not into enjoying the spoils, if you will, of business. He's into his wife, listening to the opera on the radio, going to the ball game occasionally. That's it. He organizes business and business gets even better. So much so that he says, hey, Uncle Jim, I need to give a job to an old pal of mine from Brooklyn who just happens to be ducking a murder charge right now. Um, can we bring him? Yeah, what's the kid's name? How old is he? He's 19 years old. His name is Al Capone. And this changes everything because Al Capone comes to Chicago and is willing, you know, to do everything. And then the Volstead Act happened. And Johnny Torrio sees all of the other gangs in Chicago making money, like, unprecedented because there's always money in booze. So he goes to the old mustache Pete, his uncle, and says, can we get into this 
Can we be scofflaws? Can we violate the 18th Amendment? No. Women are enough. And so, Johnny Torrio said, well, you know, my uncle, by marriage, he tells Al Capone, we are going to, we're going to snuff this dispute, this family dispute out very quietly. You kill my uncle and everything will be everything. And so this is Al Capone's first big job. And it is to change the direction of the family, just like the whole thing with drugs. And this is why the hit happened on Don Corleone, because Sonny shot his mouth off. And so the murder of Luca Brasi, as I already alluded to, this is the basis of the murder of um, Dino Banyan on the north side of Chicago in the flower shop. The, the ambidextrous, murderous henchman, one hand nailed down and the other hand held down. Whoops, click. And then, of course, this is a reenactment of the story, the, the Chicago handshake and Dino Bannon. There he is with a flower and there he is with his arms being held fast and bada bing. And so this takes us to the attempted murder of Vito Corleone. This is one of the biggest influences here. And this is where... Really, this delivers Michael to his family, the fact that his father lives, and then Michael gets all, gets beaten up as collateral damage, and he's like, I'm, I'm with you now, Papa. I'm with you now, Papa. And so, this happened in Chicago. The, the assassins gunning down Vito Corleone. Here in Chicago, okay, I'm, excuse me, I'm a step ahead. We have Michael going to visit the hospital where he's already starting to lean towards getting involved with this stuff because he loves his father, and then he moves his father because he knows that his father is being set up. And he's really, really worried, and of course, then they go out on the front of the hospital, and then that's where the police show up, and that's where all hell breaks loose. This is based on Chicago. So, this is Johnny Torrio. So Johnny Torrio has settled this thing, and the Southside Rapids are now embracing boozing it up and making all of this illegal liquor, right? Well, the enemies of these guys, the enemies of Johnny Torrio, set him up and tried to kill him in front of his own house. And they didn't. And so Al Capone, who looks at Johnny Torrio like he is a father figure, goes to visit him in the hospital. They got coming. Yeah. Police fear death of Johnny Torrio may cause outbreak of fierce gang warfare. They're trying to keep it down. Then Al Capone goes to the hospital to visit Johnny Torrio, and there are no guards on him. And he is very, very vulnerable, and he knows that Jaime Weiss is going to send the people who botched this hit earlier in the week to get him again. And so this pushes Al Capone into a, okay... I don't think he used the expression, let's go to the mattresses, but he knew he was in a total war as opposed to a tactical war at this point. And the, the, the montage, so the original plan for the Godfather film was for there to be an intermission. And indeed, when the Godfather was first released 50 years ago and changed, some theaters had intermissions. The intermission was right after Michael, oh, by the way, has everybody seen the Godfather here? Spoiler alert. Okay, sorry. Um, after Michael kills um, Captain McCluskey and Solozzo, then we have this montage of all of this to show the passage of time and to show what's going on, and then Don Corleone is whisked from the hospital home. This is where the intermission was supposed to be. So instead of doing that, they put this montage there, and all of these montage images, you know what I'm talking about, right? Where they're showing all these pictures of this gang war going on. They're all pictures from... Chicago between 1924 and 1934. I clocked them. Oh, that's a picture of, wow, Nitty. That's Frank Nitty who killed himself in his car, but they're portraying it like he got hit in his car or, or on the, 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 the train tracks. And then many, many years later, Eddie O'Hare, Al Capone's lawyer, was hit in his car. And they used that picture to all of the pictures are from Chicago, but they're used to represent this literary gang war in New York. And then, of course, the montage at the end of The Godfather, starting with Mo Green and all the rest of these dudes. Absolutely 
brilliantly directed by Puso. What has this got to do with Chicago? The very end, we have the former policeman who has put on his, his old cop uniform and is pretending to be a policeman, he takes out the number one enemy of Michael Corleone, Barsini. Where do you think they got this fake cop idea from? You know that half of the, the assailants of at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre were Capone guys dressed up as cops so they could get into Bugs Moran's headquarters without any problem. So this whole idea of fake cops stems for, as assailants, stems from Chicago. Indeed, this is a reenactment of a staging of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre where they were trying to show the public in the newspapers exactly what happened. Two cops, bang on the door, come in, this is a raid, and these guys, the seven hoods in there, laugh it off, and then the two uniform dudes usher in the two dudes with plain clothes who have Thompsons, and they spray these cats and mow them down in the back of the garage. Now, what other things from the Godfather movie? We, the, 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 the Jack Waltz character, the movie dude who was a pedophile and an extremely disgusting guy, but he goes off on Tom Hagen, right? That last meal that they have together. Well, thank you, sir. If your car could take me to the airport, Mr. Corleone is a man who insists upon hearing bad news right away. Thank you for the meal and a very ple pleasant evening. And then what happens next? The horse's head situation. The whole time, yeah, and which is, oh, by the way, remember when that scene happened and you were, oh, 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 him, um, John Marley, was that his, his name? Was that that actor's name? He went off screaming because he was told by Coppola they were gonna have a fake horse's head in the bed. When he pulled back the sheets, there was an actual horse's head that they had gotten from a dog uh, food factory or a glue factory, an actual blood. So he lost his mind, probably had to change his pants too um, at the end of the thing. So what am I getting at here? The, oops, the character of Tom Hagen, which we're gonna get into. And then, what does this eventually lead into? The Corleone family moving on Las Vegas. And this is base on the Chicago mob. How many of you were here for uh, part two of the series? I talked all about that. Yeah, I know you were, Tony. Yeah, the, the Chicago mob, after Prohibition, moved into Las Vegas hard. But this is when Las Vegas was just a cow town in the Southwest. And all of these people, just like Mo Green said, they knew the potential. And a lot of people got murdered, but this is the business they've chosen. Yeah, so Michael Corleone moves on Las Vegas. This is based on the Chicago mob. The Chicago mob to this day owns serious pieces of Las Vegas and Los Angeles. Now, in the better part of 100 years, Hollywood, in the better part of 100 years since all of this went down, there's been a whole lot of sanitation, san sanitation, sanitizing of the, the, the businesses and the money. So you have large, large, large corporations that now own, wink, wink, these things, but there are, they, they, they've got people still involved. So the Corleone family moves on Las Vegas. This is based on the Chicago mob, specifically. How many of you read The Godfather? Okay, so there was a character in The Godfather mentioned as a union operator in Los Angeles. His name was Billy Goff, and he double-crossed the Corleones and wound up blown up in his car. In real life, Willie Bioff was Chicago's, one of Chicago's main operatives with regard to union tampering and skimming of money in Hollywood. He double-crossed the Chicago mob went into wit witness protection, living a whole new life, five years later, blown up in his car in his garage, obviously based on his Chicago. And then, Murray Humphreys, the fixer, this was a dude in Chicago, nobody ever heard of him, outside of these rackets. This dude was so smooth and so quiet, he walked in, yeah, why don't you uh, do this, out. This is the basis of the character of Tom Hagen. Puso even said that himself. 
So at least he's starting to admit to it. And then the gunfights on the street that we see in every Godfather. That didn't happen in New York. Can you imagine the traffic jam? If you're trying to cross the street in midtown Manhattan and a gunfight breaks out, that's a problem. Chicago, not a problem. You know, the potholes are a bigger risk <laughs> across the street in downtown Chicago than the gunfight. All of these gunfights took place in Chicago in one way or another, reaching back to the um, Battle for Michigan Avenue and all of these other things. Click. Yes, this is another depiction of the Battle of Michi for Michigan Avenue. Uh, bang, bang, bang. Uh, raise your hand when you saw The Godfather Part Two for the second time. The God, for the, for, for, excuse me, the Godfather Part Two for the first time. And the gunfight took place on the street. Bang, bang, people. One dude got shot. Is everybody this lousy of a shot in the New York market? Come to Chicago. We'll, sh we'll teach you how to shoot straight. James Reagan Sr. <laughs> this dude was, he looks nervous already, and he's alive in this picture. He was a Chicago Cleveland syndicate operative, but mainly in Chicago. And he was really into fixing of racetrack wires and betting services and all of this. And for those of you who've never gambled, like me, you've saved yourself a lot of money. It is the most rigged of rigged businesses in this country. He was one of the, the, the pioneers in cheating people at racetracks and so forth. So he's in bed with the mafia, or excuse me, he's in bed with the Chicago mob, and the feds approach him, and he's going to flip on the Chicago mob. Well, hopefully he paid off his insurance, because not only did the mob figure out who did it, whoops, they click, my thumb's a little heavy here, click, whoops, click, there we go. The mob caught up with him, shot him down, but he lived, and so he's in the hospital. The mob sneaks in and dig this. They introduced mercury into his IV. Okay. He was dead, and this is the basis of this scene, the Hyman Roth scene in The Godfather Part Two, or I should say, the, the second attempt on Hyman Roth. But he, this is the business he chose. And then the pivotal piece in The Godfather Part Two, the Senate hearings. That was fascinating, and I was a little kid when I watched this for the first time. I said, oh, that is, I know what that's based on. That's based on everything that happened in the late 1950s McClellan Committee. And who were the point people of the McClellan Committee? Jack and Bobby Kennedy, who were in many ways sowing their own destruction by exposing this organization that they had benefited from so much over the preceding couple of decades. But this was all of these hearings were based on the things that happened with the Chicago mob. Even specifics, Anthony DeAnne Spilatro. This was an actual mobster in Chicago. You don't believe me? There's an old CTA bus right there. <laughs> Who does that look like? That guy was the, imp the, the inspiration for this character in The Godfather, part three. Um, you remember um, Vince, uh, Vincent, uh, Corleone, uh, Vincent Mancini, whose name was changed to Corleone, played by Anthony Garcia? He goes, yo, Anthony, right there for you at the wedding. Pardon me, I'm just, I'm just mimicking. That's what happened. It was hilarious. Um, this dude, click, click. <laughs> There we go. This guy is the inspiration. This actual Chicago mobster inspiration for this dude. Now you're going to see it. And whoops, this guy. Whoops, that guy. Yes, John Scalise and Albert and Selmy. There, their names are. These are the two dudes in the 1920s who um, who dipped garlic, dipped their bullets in garlic, so the infection would kill would kill people. The Anthony the Ants Spilatro used to rub his uh, bullets in garlic as a result of these two guys doing this. And these were the two of the, two of the men who were on uh, Hands for the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And he was also the inspiration. Now you see the resemblance. Anthony the Ant and Nicky Santoro. What a, what a clown? Do I amuse you? That kind of a thing. And then in The Godfather Part Three, the Senate Quanon of the executions at the very end, Andy Garcia 
as another fake cop shooting the main man who's trying to, to take his beloved uncle Michael Corleone's life. Other films of note, Little Caesar, obviously, this is based on Capone. The Joker is wild. How, how's everybody doing? It's five of three. We probably got another 10, 15 minutes. Are we good? Because I've been a little loquacious because I've not been out in public since uh, you know, my, my birth, my, my coming out party. How many of you have heard of or seen The Joker is wild? Yes, I, and this is a hard movie to find because it's been unavailable for forever. So, okay, to sum it up, Bugs Moran opened a nightclub in 1928 to compete with the Green Mill. It was called the New Rendezvous Cafe at the corner of Clark and Diversity. The building is still there. It's a Stan's Donuts now. He, in order, and he wanted to take money and business away from... Um, Capone and Jack McGurn, who owned, co-owned the uh, Green Mill. Their main cash cow was Joe E. Lewis at the, the, the Green Mill. So he goes to Joe E. Lewis and he says, hey, I am going to pay you twice what Capone is paying you to join me at the New Rendezvous Cafe. And Joey Lewis goes to Jack McGurn and says, I have a career advancement opportunity. Can you match my salary? Jack McGurn says, clearly, you don't know who you're dealing with. Um, we're not going to match your salary, and we suggest that you stay where you are. Well, not only does Joey Lewis take the gig, but in his first weekend night opening, hello, I'm Joey Lewis, because he was a singer as well as a wise guy, kind of like me. Um, <laughs> he makes fun of Al Capone and Jack McGurn in his monologue. A week later, representatives of Jack McGurn visit him and slit his throat. Oh, not enough to kill him, but enough to ruin his singing voice forever. This movie is based on this struggle, albeit brief struggle, between Jack McGurn and Joey Lewis. And this is an interesting casting choice here. Frank Sinatra playing the Joey Lewis character, probably because he had a little experience and knowing about things of this nature. But if you ever get an opportunity to see that, that's all Chicago. Ah, and then other films of note. Robin and the Seven Hoods. Who here liked this movie? Oh, good, nobody did. This is one of the worst movies ever made. It's significant because it's the last um, Rat Pack picture. And by this point, Peter Lawford had been written out, shall we say, of the Rat Pack for a number of reasons. And while this picture, which depicted Chicago in the Roaring Twenties, was being made, Kennedy got shot. So it's almost like everything is coming full circle, and that was essentially the end of the Rat Pack. Kennedy getting shot, and then a couple of months later, Sinatra's boy got kidnapped. Oh, and then the Beatles arrived, which changed change everything. But this is obviously a Chicago thing. Um, so if you want to see silly references to Chicago watches, but it did give us my kind of town Chicago is. This was written specifically for that picture. Oops. And then obviously, The Untouchables, one of the most, mm, the mendacity of this picture can't be overstated. It, it, they get almost nothing right, but it's a good movie. They, they do everything wrong for the sake of advancing the narrative and to show as much murdering as possible. It's really inaccurate, but it's a really good picture. Um, and it was shot in Chicago, and the, the, the Lexington Hotel is portrayed by the Blackstone Hotel. Elliot Ness was a drunk and a skirt chaser and one of the biggest frauds in the history of Americana. But who cares? Who cares? It gave us some stuff. Obviously, it's set in Chicago. But this scene, Al Capone, um, this Al Capone was not the baseball bat wielder in this scene. When Jack McGurr set up John Scalise and Albert and Selmy for this party, it was Tony Accardo who wielded the baseball bat. And that's why his nickname was Joey Batters. But this is absolutely based on something that happened in Chicago. And then, do you remember the picture American Gangster with Denzel Washington and uh, Russell Crowe from about 15 years ago? Very, very, very loosely based on something that happened. How many of you watched that picture? Okay. You recall that the big change, the big turn in the plot was when 
Denzel, Denzel Washington as Bumpy John, as Frank uh, Reynolds, shows up at the fight of the century, the, the first Ali Frazier fight, and he's wearing a sable hat and coat, and nobody knew who he was until after the fight, and every cop said, who is this cat from Harlem with a sable coat and hat? He was showing off, and he, he went on to every cop's radar as a result. This is what Al Capone eventually, this eventually got Al Capone, this flashy, loud, flamboyant style. Whereas Lucky Luciano would just walk in, dark suit, every other hood in America, dark suit, collar pulled up, hat pulled down, Al Capone, big white hat, diamonds on his belt buckle, walking in, hey, here's some money, hey, I'm Al Capone, I love being a celebrity, be careful of uh, what you love. And then, of course, The Departed up in Boston, an homage to Chicago. When the kingpin gets murdered, he is a floral director, and he is murdered in his own flower shop. And I just came across this because there's a movie called Chicago Overcoat. If this is not the most obvious homage to Chicago and all of the fables and legends and stories about Chicago, there it is. Major television. Obviously, The Untouchables, and as, as entertaining as The Untouchables film was, although inaccurate, The Untouchables television program was really, really accurate, maybe because they could play it out over the, over the course of ever how many seasons it was on. There was something very, very specific. I didn't, when, when this show was on TV, I was a little, little kid, so I didn't understand what poppies were. <laughs> and they something with poppies in it, Scarecrow, poppies, and I didn't understand heroin and all of that in the heroin industry. However, there was an episode, and I don't know why it resonated with me, but Elliot Ness walks in, Bob Stack is Elliot Ness, you know, we need to find that tree of death in Chicago's Little Italy. Like, tree of death? What in the hell is this dude talking tree of death? And my parents live in Little Italy. I said, this is some, this is some bull poo poo here, the tree of death. I started to research it. Before Prohibition began in Chicago's Little Italy, extortion was the thing. Kidnapping and extortion. Nobody was doing any running of rum or anything. And so, you you know, you go up to a guy, hey, so how's that, how's that dress shop going? Where's my money? How's your bakery going? Where's my money? And then rather than do that, they just started to tap people's names up on this tree as if it was a, an invoice. And so if they didn't come through with their money, they wound up dead. This is how this poplar tree at the junction of Loomis and Taylor got the name, the tree of death. I'm not making this up. The Mob Doctor was a, big, was a TV show that was on for just a couple of minutes, and it was not only based on Chicago, but it was shot in Chicago. And there were so many things that reached back to things that allegedly happened in the 20s and 30s. A good, a law-abiding, well-intentioned person gets caught up with the rackets and then they are pursuing, inadvertently pursuing this life of crime. Breaking Bad, Vince Gilliam, who, how many of you watched Breaking Bad? Oh my gosh, one of the best TV shows ever. I've watched it through in, in its entirety three times now because you always pick something else up. Well, Spoiler alert, Vince Gilliam talked about the last episode of Breaking Bad. He said he wanted it to, he wanted everybody who watched it to say St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And if that's not an homage to Chicago, I don't know what is. And then The Shy, this wonderful television program, The Shy. How many of you watched The Shy? How many of you have been in an episode or two of The Shy, Melanie? Yeah. Um, every. So, Tony, every season of The Shy, there's a spectacular hit, like in the last episode, right? That's, oh, you know, you'll be sitting there, oh, and red wine flying all over the place. That was great. Let's watch it again. You know, and all Chicago, all over it. And then, Boardwalk Empire, the first accurate depiction of Al Capone I've ever seen. And of course, it takes a British actor to play Al Capone mm -hmm. properly. Not only did he have the size right and the portliness of Capone right without being obese, he had Capone's voice down and he humanized Al Capone. They showed a scene 
of Capone with his son Albert. He was playing a mandolin, singing, my buddy, my buddy. Al Capone was a great musician and a songwriter. When he got to Alcatraz, one of the first things he did was he had instruments bought for Alcatraz so they had a band. Um, didn't work out. The city of Chicago itself. We see the city of Chicago playing New York and, of course, itself and other roaring 20s and terrible 30s towns all the times, all the times in the picture. If you saw the sting, that was all over the green line of the south side of Chicago. We didn't call it the green line back in those days. Also, the road to perdition set in Chicago, shot in Chicago, and a lot of bad Chicago dialects, frankly, in that picture. And who How many of you saw this picture, which depicted the interesting relationship between... And Tony's hand goes up for every one of these things. <laughs> Dutch Schultz, Lucky Luciano, and um, Bumpy Johnson in the 1920s. Guess what? This was shot in Chicago. I was watching this in the late, late, late show. Late, 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 late show one night. Couldn't sleep. In spite of help. And I'm watching this, I heard this is New York. This is New York? That's LaSalle Street. The hell? That's the Board of Trade building. What the hell? They were having the city of Chicago play New York. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if that's not New York and being Chicago, I don't know what is. And then, everybody liked Batman. But Batman, the first Batman by Christopher Nolan, and the second one, are not superhero movies. They're gangland pictures with summits and, hey, let's go see the Italian, and all of that. And Batman himself, in the first two Batman pictures, looking down on old Gotham City, old Gotham City versus new Gotham City, and this is the thrust of both of the first two Batman pictures. The old way of doing business, and the old, hey, I'm the head of, I'm the head of old Gotham City. You might be the head of the old Gotham City, but right now, you're just old, bad thing. And then the second one, the Joker, Getting in everybody's mess, burning up a whole truckload of money. Spoiler alert. And, like I said, the second one, Batman back again, and the Joker. And then Chicago, Chicagoans ourselves, of course, Al Capone and all of the influences that he's had. And then the influence of Diamond Jim Colosimo with those diamonds in his pockets and flipping up diamonds and catching them. The inspiration of all of these gangsters you see walking down the street. As if a gangster is not busy enough to be walking down the street flipping a coin up in the air. And then maybe the epitome, the notorious machine gun Jack McGurn and his girlfriend Louise Roth in Chicago were the basis of every glamorous mob couple in TV and in film for eternity because Jack McGurn was the best dressed gangster in the United States after Al Capone. But unlike Capone, he was athletic, handsome and whatnot, and then his girl was a big time flapper. Oh, don't make me mashed potato. Um, Louise Rolfe. When these guys met one another by 1927, everybody who knew both of them said, we've been waiting for you guys to meet because you're the perfect couple. And indeed, after the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, he married her so she could not testify against him in court and was known as the blonde alibi for the rest of her life. Yes, and every time you see some picture depicting a glamorous mob couple with perfect clothes, you are looking at the legacy of the snarkiness, which was a word back in the 20s which meant really, really well put together in nice clothes. The snorkiness of Al Capone and Jack McGurr. And then the handsome hood. There's always a handsome hood. Meet Johnny Roselli. This handsome, don't let his good looks fool you. This might be the guy that killed Marilyn Monroe and was one of the contractors when Kennedy got shot in Dallas. But he's handsome, isn't he? And um, he, and sadly, he uh, went missing and then was found in an oil drum um, in Florida in the 1970s, near where, uh, what's his name's body was uh, found? Uh, Hoffa. Yeah, and a bunch of other people. But this is Johnny Roselli, who's the inspiration for the handsome hoods of all of this time. The handsome hood in Boardwalk Empire, inspired by him. Ah, uh, and then Sam Giancana. He knew 
he, he knew he was going to give a big smile, so he took off his toupee because Sam Giancana is the inspiration for every crazy mobster in film and television. He was called Momo and Crazy Sam because you didn't want to tick this dude off. In song, as we wind it up here, Chicago, Chicago, the top of town. Everybody's heard that song, right? You've only heard the chorus. That's the chorus of the song. So you think, oh, this is a wonderful song. Chicago, Chicago, that title in town. The town of the Billy Sunday could not shut down State Street. And that's it. Wrong. That's the chorus. The verse is, da -da -da -da. I got a gal, I got a pal, I'm in the sea waiting for me, so I'm gonna go. Da -da 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 -da. I'm gonna make it out by the lake. Da -da 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 -da. And it's this whole thing which leads in to Chicago, Chicago, that title in town, the town that Billy Sunday could not shut down. Billy Sunday was an evangelical crazy man when it came to the temperance movement. And he wanted, he was one of the biggest champions of the 18th Amendment and everything. And so Fred Fisher, when he wrote this song in 1921, he, he had just moved to Chicago. And he was not talking about State Street because it was a great place to stop. He was talking about, whoa, he was talking about S South State Street. Moreover, not only was he talking about prohibition, the middle eight of this song goes like this. Let's see. At college and you'll learn about jazz. At college and you'll get beer in a glass. More colored people in state treat you see than you would if you were in Tennessee. This is a reference to the Stroll area, which was Chicago's answer to the Harlem Renaissance directly south of the Levee District. In other words, if you wanted to have fun in Chicago, to hell with Marshall Fields. Go to the Levy District and a stroll because you're going to get beer in a glass. You're going to see a lot of pretty girls. You're going to dance to Charleston and the tango and have some fun. But this song was all about the Roaring Twenty Chicago. Yes, this was the Levy District. I should have been advancing. And then directly south of that, Chicago's legendary stroll. What's the jailhouse rock got to do? When you get to that last verse of the jailhouse rock, the whole rhythm said it was a purple gang. Let's rock. Who's the purple gang? Purple Gang was a Jewish outfit in Detroit, Al Capone's greatest um, allies outside of Chicago. And the Purple Gang and Al Capone smuggled the booze down from Canada into Chicago with the help of William Randolph Hearst and Joseph P. Kennedy. That's the Purple Gang. Uh, they, a bunch of them got arrested. Seriously, this is the, uh, pur the Purple Gang. A bunch of them got arrested, and they all saw the same camera, and this is how they greeted the camera. My kind of town, Chicago is, does not mention the, sh the Roaring Twenties at all. But if that movie doesn't get made, this song doesn't get written. How many of you remember this song? Daddy was a cop on the east side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. The night Chicago died. <laughs> yeah, don't gotta get to the chorus. Yeah, this was about, this, this was, anybody in Chicago heard this song, Daddy was a cop on the east side of Chicago. I was like, east side of Chicago? That's Lake Michigan. I, and it's our side. I live on the south side. Um, and there's no Al Capone at 87th and Stony Island. And then I found out the dude who wrote the song, this guy, was a British dude. It's like, oh, Paper Lace, a British band. And you can hear it. Um, and so he called his gang the war, the forces of the war. He slips and his British dialect comes out and he says, war, not law. So, but, this is a British song by a British rock band in the 1970s talking about Al Capone's uh, and his exploits 50 years before. Smooth Criminal by the late great Michael Jackson grew up not far from here. He was trying to make this an homage to Chicago in the 20s and Al Capone. I have no idea. Oh, I think this is telling me that this is the uh, home stretch. Yeah, oh, and, t and, and little things that come out now. How many of you watch the show Billions? Yeah, every episode practically has a reference to what? The Godfather. And if they just, by the principle of contagious diffusion and transference, algebra, um, if The Godfather was influenced by Chicago and Billions was influenced by The Godfather, then the Chicago mob indirectly has influenced shows like Billions. And then there are exhibits all over the place talking about the mob and who always winds up 
in the middle of all of these mob presentations. There he is, Abraham Lincoln, right there in his camel colored coat. And then we have we have pop culture. This is obviously, this is not Al Capone's actual driver's license, but you can go to a souvenir store and get a laminated Al Capone driver's license to, for fun and amusement with your family. Oh, and by the way, while you're there, get this t-shirt, 100% cotton, guaranteed to shrink a half size. <laughs> and then, oh, look over there, there's a tattoo shop where you can get an Al Capone tattoo. Now, ladies and gentlemen, why on earth, what? I mean, I can understand you having your own child's picture on, on your body, but look at this. Not one, but two, three people all getting the same tattoo of Al Capone in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And this is a picture I took a couple of months ago. There's a mural in, on the south side of Chicago, right near the Cinespace um, movie studio. All of these things that pay tribute to Chicago. And smack dab in the middle Alphonse Capone. Rocky Part 2. Who's this? Al Capone? Remember that scene where they're, they're, they're trying to goad Rocky Balboa into fighting and finally Apollo gets under his skin and at the press conference? I'm going to try real hard. Mick and I are going to try real hard. As long as he's going to punch out. Now who is this? Al Capone? Come to me you're not. Okay, it's got nothing to do with Chicago until they say Al Capone. Stripes. Ooh, they're from Chicago. Bang, bang. <laughs> the end of stripes. And my, my friends, underdog and the riffraff character. All about Chicago. And the legend, look at this. Chicago Legends Coloring. This is a, 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 a coloring book printed in Spain. In Spanish, it is about a gunfight in Chicago. And so, my friends, to sum it up, all this says to me, is something I've been saying every time that I've stepped professionally on a bus or in a library or on a stage anywhere. Chicago is the center of the universe. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this and you want to check me out again, I'll be here this summer with something else. But my Facebook page is facebook.com, music and Chicago stuff. Like me there. My website that I update every pandemic is clarencegoodman.wixsite.com slash Clarence Goodman. My book is out. It was released on March 15th, 2020. So I happen to have a few copies uh, on my person today. But a shout of appreciation and respect and love for my buddy Tony out there. Give it up for him. Everybody else in the Hawaiian Public Library and mostly to yourselves for coming out to see this crazy man for an hour and a quarter until our paths cross again. Keep on rocking your library as well as taking care of yourselves. God bless you and keep you. Thank you very much. Again. <laughs>